Welcome to our eOrganic webinar. Today we will be hearing from Dr. Brad Hines, who will be sharing his research looking at forage species within dairy grazing systems. My name is Deb Haliba, and I work at the University of Vermont Extension as eOrganic's dairy team coordinator. eOrganic is the organic agriculture community of practice with eExtension, and you can find all of our published articles, videos, and upcoming and recorded webinars at eExtension.org org slash organic underscore production. Today's webinar has funding support from the USDA Organic Research and Extension Initiative as well as the Farmers Advocating for Organic Fund. If you do plan to share the recording or the information presented today with others, we'd greatly appreciate acknowledgement of the organic and today's speaker. So before we get started, I wanted to give a quick uh, overview of today's agenda. The session is scheduled to end at quarter past the hour. Brad will give his presentation for about 45 minutes and then we'll ask you to respond to two quick poll questions that will pop up on your screen. Then we'll transition over to our question and answer session for the remainder of our time together. Okay, now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Dr. Brad Hines is an assistant professor in the Department of Animal Science at the University of Minnesota focusing on organic dairy production. Currently, Brad conducts his research at the University of Minnesota's West Central Research and Outreach Center in Morris, Minnesota. The center has a split uh, dairy herd. 100 head are raised in an organic, certified organic system, and 130 head are raised in a conventional grazing system. Brad's research has included the work he'll talk about today, but he's also conducted research looking at outwintering um, of livestock and their performance, as well as livestock genetics and crossbreeding. Brad, thank you very much for joining us today. You're welcome. Good afternoon to everybody uh, on the webinar. And today we're going to talk a little bit about the research that we've been doing here on grazing systems and forage quality of grasses. And we'll touch a little bit about what we've been doing uh, in those aspects, looking at warm season grasses and some of the research that we've done on farms. A little bit, like Deb said, uh, we're at the University of Minnesota. I'm way out in western Minnesota where the cow uh, picture is, about two and a half hours west of Minneapolis and St. Paul on a thousand acre research station. About 700 acres are organic. Sort of a <clears throat> background overview of our extensive pasture system, about 400 acres of pasture that's used for milking cows. Uh, heifers uh, and dry cows. So we have a lot of paddocks and can do a lot of great research uh, with forages. So it's kind of a background on our two herds. Uh, we have uh, an organic herd, about 120 cows. That's the production as of today uh, in the winter time here. Uh, we calve a lot in the spring, so production's a little bit lower right now. We're starting to dry off a lot of cows. Milk prices quite high, almost $40 a hundredweight. Our conventional grazing herd, a little bit more production, uh, supplemented a little bit more uh, than our organic herd, but you can see milk price is about half as much as the organic. And we use a lot of different breeds in our uh, breeding system here in, in both herds. So a little bit about rotational grazing. Obviously, it's management. There's a lot of uh, issues that might come along with that, but probably the biggest one is there's a long time between the change in a grazing uh, system until you actually realize the effect, and we've noticed that um, especially in, when the weather gets, uh, when you get drought problems, things like that, it takes a pasture a long time to bounce back, and maybe the cows don't quite recover as nice. And there's a lot of other aspects. Uh, weather, that's probably the biggest thing that we've had um, and a basis for a lot of the research that I'm going to talk about today is looking at weather and how we can sort of keep a long season forage supply out there. Variation in feed quality is a, another thing. Uh, pastures are very different. We see that across our uh, 15 pastures here that feed quality is very different between all of the pastures. And then stocking rate is probably another big one. You know, how many cows you have on that pasture. Um, maybe if you start running into a drought, do you need to reduce your stocking rate? Do you need to cull cows, things like that, to make sure you have enough grass uh, for that pasture? 
obviously uh, pasture intake is probably the biggest thing uh, in an organic grazing system so why should we really worry about that obviously uh, probably the big thing is pasture based dairy cows have less milk yield due to reduced dry matter intake and not necessarily forage quality forage quality is very high in pastures and sometimes it's almost too good for milking cows that we don't need all the protein that we have um, but if they don't eat enough they're not going to have increased milk production and really how if we don't know how much grass is in our pasture how much we will know how, what to supplement really is is the big question too some people supplement uh, here right now we've gone to mostly a grass-based diet uh, only feeding about eight pounds of corn during the summer and the rest is pasture and again you can only grow so much so we really don't want to waste it there's a lot of those issues so kind of a a chart that I've used for some producers um, maybe trying to look at an all grass based diet um, you can see some of the differences between grasses grass legumes and legumes um, kind of what the recommended levels are for net energy of lactation and the grasses are quite high um, so maybe a little bit lower than what we might want to be recommended but um, pretty good for making milk production crude protein is a lot is very high in a lot of the grass and legume species you know lactating cow diet you'd want around 16 percent protein and most of the grasses are well above that and we've done some sampling in our pastures at prime season and we can we can get almost 40 percent protein in some of our grass mixtures so um, that's very high and we, we cows might not need that much protein uh, NDF is much higher um, in grass and grass legume mixtures than what sort of recommended so they're very digestible um, they go through the cow quite quickly and provide uh, great nutrients and obviously the non-fiber carbohydrates um, is quite less and that's where people typically supplement corn to make up for the lost um, non-fiber carbohydrates in the diet so there's a lot of things that affect dry matter intake on pasture um, you have animal factors you have body size here you can see some Jersey cows uh, from University of New Hampshire dairy that I took when I was out there um, we have Holsteins and a different crossbreds and I bet all of our animals consume different dry matter intakes uh, based on just the breed of the animal obviously milk production has its effect and and genetic merit certainly plays a part in feed efficiency and um, those regards and then there's some pasture factors that certainly affect dry matter intake what's the height of the pasture are you grazing it at five to six inches um, or are you letting it grow to 12 to 16 inches some people graze a little bit higher to maybe have more pasture cover and what's the density you know is there a lot of ground cover uh, not so much ground cover do you need to reseed some of your pastures to sort of help increase the the density and the diversity a lot of studies have shown that diverse pastures are very good for cows and cows tend to consume more intake when the pasture is much more diverse so there's a lot of things to think about when you think about grass species selection obviously grazing management is a big thing you know are you going to rotationally graze are you intensively grazing that uh, split up into very small paddocks uh, or mob grazing um, those you know some grasses do better than others fertility is probably another big thing what's the nutrient um, what's what are the nutrients in, in your pasture do you need to fertilize your <coughs> pastures uh, organically to help improve the the forage quality um, those are certain things to look at um, <coughs> variety differences obviously play a big part of it but I think diversity is probably the big thing uh, that I'd like to stress that diverse pastures are probably a key to uh, sort of increasing dry matter intake and, and being able to select the right grass species <coughs> here's a lot of some of the um, grass species that we're using and in some of our pastures uh, here in the upper Midwest um, meadow fescue is probably a, one of the big ones we've gone to some of the more improved orchard grasses uh, that, that cows do like a little bit better obviously brome grass smooth brome grass is is all over pastures um, that 
that grows quite well and does and actually is very good nutrition. Uh, Timothy, canary grass, uh, perennial rye. There's a lot of different grass species that can work. And I don't think one size fits all for, for every farm. Obviously, there's a lot of factors that play into that. And you have to look at your management to be able to figure out what sort of grass species um, you might like. Well, a lot of them are, are uh, very different. Uh, oops, there's you have different yields, uh, palatability, obviously, Timothy's quite well, forage quality, meadow fescue might be one of the best. Uh, there's ones that are very persistent, um, obviously, bluegrass is very well for grazing tolerance. Um, over bluegrass tends to do quite well when you've uh, uh, maybe grazed a little too hard, and ryegrass can be very easy to uh, establish. So there's a lot of different factors to look at when planting a pasture and what sort of to reseed in into those pastures. Um, <clears throat> we look at some of these different species here, and especially in the upper half of the United States, we want winter hardy types, obviously, ones that are late maturing. Um, we want good seasonal distribution across their yield, and some of us want sort of a rust-resistant uh, variety. And you can see there are some different varietal changes in just the graph that I have there of different orchard grass. Um, the yield does change quite a bit across the grazing season, depending on the different varieties. So, you know, you must research the varieties that you're going to use uh, for those grass species to be able to sort of look out and you know, plan your forage horizon to be able to provide enough grass for, for cows on pasture. So I want to look a little, a little bit about some of the research in that we've done looking at uh, some seasonal changes and how dry matter intake, crude protein, and digestibility of pasture forages sort of changes across the grazing season. How uh, We looked at 10 farms in Minnesota. Uh, this was uh, a few years ago. They were sampled every two weeks, so every two weeks somebody went out and sampled the grass on the pastures to see what the quality was, um, We and we uh, analyzed those at a commercial lab uh, for many different forage qualities. This is um, Minnesota, so we, we tried to get a distribution across the whole state of different grazing dairies um, to give, a, give us a good picture of what my, what my what we might see, and there's some pretty big temperature differences in the state of Minnesota from north to south. So this is what we sort of see um, across um, in, the, in the different farms. You can see uh, we had 10 farms. Uh, WC is actually the University of Minnesota here, so uh, I single signaled that out so you're able to see what, what we have here, but dry matter is fairly consistent across uh, all of the farms. Uh, however, crude protein can certainly change. Some are down at 19% protein, and some are averaging up to 24% protein on their grasses. So there is a wide range in, in crude protein digestibility as well. Some farms have grasses that are very digestible, um, and some maybe not so much. Um, Morris uh, here at, at the bottom, we're right around 50, so we're one of the higher ones for NDF. We also looked at across the grazing season, so we sort of lumped them into spring, summer, and fall, and we wanted to see how the, those changes occur across the, across the grazing season. Uh, dry matter is quite high in the spring and summer, and maybe not so much in the fall. Uh, crude protein, however, was quite surprising, and we're starting to see that now, that crude protein maybe is a little bit higher in the grasses in the, in the fall, but they tend not to be as digestible. Uh, obviously, the grasses in the summertime uh, had the highest NDF uh, digestibility. And in the fall, you know, they might be higher in protein, but they tend to be a little more lignified, and the grass is getting old, and the cows don't really like to, to consume that as well. And in the fall, we cows, you can tell they're a little more selective in their grazing um, in the fall. Across our two years, not much difference uh, for, for any of the forage characteristics. We look at digestibility. Uh, 
TTNDFD is a measure of uh, total tract digestibility uh, for these forages. <clears throat> it does change a little bit. Spring is, is quite high. Um, summer not so much so the digestibility goes down in in the summertime the grasses maybe are you know not not growing as well because of the hot weather uh, so the digestibility goes down uh, really but across the grazing season we tend to get about 2600 <clears throat> pounds of milk per per acre of uh, pasture so um Really, we, we, we can be pretty consistent across, but there are some differences based on the, the time of the year, and certainly weather can be a, play a big factor in, in what, what might happen. Farms um, are really different. You know, some of these farms, the, the soil, we never measured the soil characteristics of these farms, and that uh, probably is an important thing. Some of these were a little more sandy type soils than others, so obviously soil fertility plays a lot in the forage quality of these grasses. But really digestibility is quite different uh, among farms, so they, there's a big range in digestibility as well as relative forage quality. There's, um, you know, some farms are down at 120 forage quality. We're kind of right in the middle here, west central, but some of these uh, farms had 160 uh, RFQ in their pastures, so really good pastures uh, for these farms. And some of those were actually on irrigated land, so some of the farms that had irrigated pastures were able to produce a more consistent supply of pasture and probably a little more high quality pasture. Uh, minerals uh, do change across the grazing season. Um, here's calcium, phosphorus, potassium in the grass. Uh, calcium goes up uh, as the grazing season goes on. Uh, phosphorus not, not so much, uh, kind of pretty consistently. And then potassium starts up, goes down, and comes back up uh, in the fall. So there are some mineral differences, and that plays a part in weather, soil fertility, and, and a lot of different things uh, with that as well. A lot of the farms are quite different in their mineral composition of, of their pasture. You can see some have really high calcium levels in their pasture, some not so much down here at 0.68, so there's a big difference between farm 8 and 9. We're kind of right in the middle here at 0.81. Phosphorus, uh, kind of all, right around 0.4 is where they, they typically average, and potassium, some are, are much higher than, than others. Obviously, and ours were a little bit uh, on the upper level for potassium in our pastures. But probably the big thing, um, sort of the take home from that sort of study is really pasture quality differs across farm. We all know that. It depends on soil fertility, irrigation, weather. Uh, forage and species quality, but we just wanted to get a handle on what was happening across some farms and, and be able to tell, sort of help direct some of our research and in, in what these farms are actually looking at and, and where we should go from there. So kind of a nice picture uh, here of our cows out on pasture. Um, so I really wanted to discuss something about summer annuals today and why we moved into some of the summer annual production. Really, they're, they're drought tolerant. Uh, they might provide an emergency forage, uh, especially when there's a, a drought uh, in line. I know one of the years that we were on this study, if we went to have those summer annuals, we would have had to start supplementing cows. So by having some of these uh, summer annuals, we were able to keep grazing and not having to use stored feed. They can supply high tonnage, and you can graze them or bale them. Uh, this is a picture of maybe a little some summer annuals, maybe some differences. There's some oats in there. There's also uh, some sorghum sedan, some sunflower. Uh, I think that's a 12 species mix that uh, they graze during the summer. But really, why did we want to look at summer annuals? And this sort of graph um, shows probably the biggest reason. You get a lot of the cool season grasses that come on in production in May and June. They sort of dive off in July and August, don't produce as much tonnage, and then they kind of come back a little bit. Uh, but if you look at sort of uh, sorghum sudan grass, is one I'm going to talk about, that sort of has high 
production uh, in July and August when the cool season grasses don't produce as much. So if we can use those summer annuals and incorporate it into our grazing system, uh, we might alleviate this uh, this summer slump, as they call it, in, in the cool season species. So really what, what makes a good summer annual? Obviously it has to be palatable. Uh, the cows have to eat it. If they're not going to eat it, then it's probably a waste. Uh, they need to be able to eat it and enjoy what they're eating. You want to have good intake on pasture. Uh, you want them to eat a lot of them uh, so they can keep uh, production levels high. Digestibility and nutrient content is obviously a, a big thing. You want to have high forage quality. <clears throat> Animal performance. Uh, you want to be able to uh, uh, animals to have high production, maybe increase production while they're on these summer annuals or at least maintain production uh, without without dropping. And obviously there's a lot of different ways that you can harvest these. Um, you, some people do high, harvest them for silage. We have harvested some of our sorghum sedans for silage, but for the most part we've, we've been grazing them and uh, letting the cows do the job of harvesting instead of uh, using um, our fossil fuels to do that. So really how do we sort of establish these summer annuals? Well, we want the soil temperature to be at 60 to 65 degrees. Uh, that certainly can be an issue uh, uh, some years where it's getting the third week of May and we're still wondering, you know, are we going to get these grasses in on time by by early, by the first of June and it does warm up, but you might have to think, you know, these, these grasses you might have to wait, especially in the northern climates. You might have to wait till the third week of May or, or so to actually establish these, these summer annuals. We found that a grain drill probably works the best. Uh, there's lots of different ways that you can seed them, but you want really good uh, seed to soil contact, so uh, a grain drill has is, is worked best. We, you know, we've gone into our seeds and field, culti or field cultivated some of our pastures to provide that good seed to soil contact. Like I said, you want to plant them mid-May through early June, obviously depending on the weather, and typically about an inch to an inch and a half deep uh, for, for some of these grasses. So there's many types of summer annuals. Um, you have sorghums, you have Sudan grasses, you have the sorghum Sudan grass, and you have a lot of BMR varieties for sorghum Sudan grass that people uh, producers might select. There's millets. A lot of people have decided to use millets because of um, not worried too much about the prussic acid issue. And then teff grass, which is mainly used in the southeast United States with beef cattle, but we've been doing some experiments up here. Um, and that's some of the pictures there are some of our research plots and the different uh, summer annuals that we've been growing in sorghum sedan uh, grasses. So these are sort of some of the two that we're, we've uh, decided to work with here. Uh, sorghum sedan grass, you know, they <clears throat> do quite well with some moderate regrowth. Uh, there's BMR varieties. We've been using a BMR variety in our an organic BMR variety for our sorghum sedan trials, and that's a picture of, of our pastures uh, there, uh, quite nice green leafy sorghum sedan grass. And then we've been using teff grass. It's a little bit smaller, um, very leafy though, um, more resembles a, a cool season perennial pasture. Uh, it can be very tolerant to many different soil types. It might not need as much water. Uh, as a sorghum sedan grass. And obviously these two summer annuals do take a lot less water than a perennial pasture and they can grow even when there's drought conditions. And tough grows very rapidly uh, from seeding to grazing uh, can be as little as uh, nine weeks. So the, the sorghum sedans, um, typically most of the sorghums, the, the really sorghums are a sort of a one cut alternative, but uh, sorghum sedans, you sort of get that grazing uh, mentality. You can harvest them three, maybe four times during the year. Uh, however, a little peop some people are concerned about the prussic acid poisoning in the sorghum sedan grass. And, you know, we haven't really been worried about that too much here. Um, as long as you graze it, um, you know, 18 to 36 inches uh, and, you know, wait till 
if you have frost, grazing it two weeks after frost, and you know we we have grazed it after a frost, and we just haven't had any problems. Uh, we haven't had any problems when we've harvested it for silage either. So I think management is probably the big thing in being able to make those sorghum sedans work. So some pictures of of what our what our grazing looks like. This was sort of the first year that. Uh, we used this uh, in 2013, kind of the first time we really started exploring some of these summer annuals. You know, most of the time when I first started here, uh, pastures dried up quite quickly and they started supplementing cows in the summertime. So uh, we wanted to look at these different grass species so we didn't have to supplement cows in the summertime. We could uh, graze. The first year we were... Uh, we may be grazed at a little high. You can see some of the cows are lost in the sorghum sedan grass, and um, that was a big learning curve. Was trying to figure out, you know, when to graze this stuff. This this grass can grow a foot overnight, so when it gets hot and dry, it grows fast, and before you know it, it's uh, just as tall as the cows. But in the second year, you know, you you start to think things out, and you maybe graze it a little bit shorter. Um, you in some of the pictures here, you can see there's a little bit of pigweed in there. Is our organic pastures? We we have plowed them, and and so there might be some weed weed pressure in there. But typically, the sorghum sedans uh, do quite well in in uh, trying to suppress the weeds uh, in those pastures. Uh, and you get nice even uh, forage distribution across the the pastures, and it provides uh, quite a bit of forage quality. Uh, for the cows, and uh, they do quite well. You can see they, when they graze, they basically they start they strip down the leaves first, leave the stems, and and um, then go back through. And they do trample some of it, and um, they they pick it up later. And this is kind of a contrast of the pasture here. You can see on the right a little bit about the the new grazing that they haven't gone into, and. Uh, on the left, the bigger chunk is how they how well they've grazed this pasture uh, down to almost nothing and and provide good regrowth opportunities. They they pretty much uh, they they do eat it all. Uh, they they do a very good job in cleaning all of the sorghum sedan up. And um, after that's done, we'll we've typically gone in with maybe a a, a mower and mowed off some of those stems to provide for kind of a faster regrowth. Uh, on the sorghum sedans, but they they do well uh, and they do like the grazing. So what about teff? Um, teff grass was sort of a northern African grass from Ethiopia. Um, it's a warm season grass. It's not very cold tolerant. When it gets cold, uh, it doesn't grow very well. Um, and it, if it's cool, it, it, it does slow down the growth quite significantly. It's very small seed, really small, uh, smaller than alfalfa. Um, it's um, you get a lot of seeds per pound. It's very palatable, highly digestible, and some people use it for for a horse hay market. Um, and it and it grows quickly. Like I said before, uh, we can graze probably 45 to 50 days after we've planted it. So this is sort of a picture. Um, of, of teff grass that's maybe a little bit uh, taller, uh, closer this is being produced for seed, uh, but you can see it, it provides a, a nice good cover uh, across the, the grazing season. And we've gone in with a drill, uh, so this is our, our planting of our, our teff. You can see that uh, we've planted it direct seeded into a plowed pasture and um, it, it comes up within a, a few weeks after planting and provides pretty good cover. And then when we start grazing it, um, you can there's a, a lot of forage out there for those for those cows uh, uh, to be able to graze. And it really does look like a perennial pasture. Uh, you don't have uh, you might not we we haven't gone in and mowed the, this pasture like we have the sorghum sedan grass afterwards. Um, and it does regrow quite well when it's dry. The first year that we used it, we grazed it five times. Um, when it was not so wet last year, we were only grazing it maybe twice, two and a half times. So it, it the weather is very picky on the teff grass. But when we grazed them side by side, you can see that it uh, does quite well. A nice good field, a, a teff on the left and sorghum sedan on the right. 
and they were both planted on the same day. However, like I said last year, uh, we had one field. Uh, doesn't look like much tough grass in that field. When the weather was cool, it was 50 degrees all the way through June here, um, and not very much direct sunlight. So the weeds kind of took over one of our teff pastures, and uh, the teff never grew in there. So uh, it's a little more picky on the weather than sorghum Sudan grass might be. So this is sort of what what we've recommended, uh, what our you know planting rate is. We're out seeding. Um, you know, sort of the recommended is 35 to 55 pounds an acre, but we decided we we were going to go about 25 pounds an acre uh, for the sorghum Sudan grass here in Morris. And then the TEF we uh, recommended was four to eight, but or four to five. But we went with eight. We wanted to be able to provide a good stand for the cows and provide, make sure we had a lot of forage out there and good ground cover. So that's sort of what what we've gone with in in our uh, seeding methods on pasture. Um, we've um, put some manure on the the. The pastures before we've planted them, just you know, manure from our wintering uh, lots uh, when we, we house the cows in uh, in our bedded packs. Uh, so we have put some of that fertility on those pastures to provide uh, some nitrogen for for those grasses. And we've seeded into um, into alfalfa fields as well, plowed up alfalfa fields when we first started, and put some sorghum sedan grass on those. So I talk a little bit about our kind of our grazing experiment what we've done a little bit. Um, these are our, our sort of mixes that we've been using. Uh, you can see there's, uh, so we wanted to compare two systems, cows that were grazing perennial pasture all the way through the grazing season, and then cows that started on perennial pasture, went to a, a summer annual, sedan grass and teff grass, and then maybe rotated back to the perennial pastures and then went to some oats and turnips actually in the fall to see if we could extend the grazing season uh, even further. But you can see these are some of our mixes that we've interceded into our pastures. We've used ryegrass, red and white clover. We've included some chicory in the in the mixes. Uh, alfalfa, I do like alfalfa to provide some of that legume um, and high protein uh, in the mix and uh, meadow fescue in some of our pastures as well. So these were our, our, our planting dates. Um, typically, we've our perennial pasture, we, we, we did uh, interseed in early to mid-April, obviously weather dependent, but just as soon as the frost uh, came out and it wasn't muddy anymore, we went and seeded those and um, did provide a good growing environment for those perennial uh, seeds to, to start. Our warm season grasses, we planted May 20th to May 31st, depending on the year. And oats and turnips, uh, we seeded those in August, about the third, second to third week in August uh, for, for grazing in early October. Uh, some, this, is, this is what we use, uh, a seeder. It's a, a buffalo true axe drill uh, we, where we can seed um, many different types of grazing species. It's a no-till drill. You can see I... I uh, took this one night, I was out seeding some of the pastures, uh, and it provides actually pretty good seed-to-soil contact uh, in a no-till way into sort of some of the existing pastures if we tried to rejuvenate those. So it's uh, been quite well, and I think I, I was doing this about April 15th one year, and uh, our grasses actually did quite well that year. This is, uh, this is our clipping method. I had talked a little bit about that before. But we also might clip some of our organic pastures. You know, we uh, we do have some thistles in them, and we tend to go out and mow those to keep the thistles under control. Uh, that's probably the biggest way to to uh, to control those. And this is how we mow them and and mow some of our sorghum sedan grasses to provide a pretty good regrowth. But you can see what our Diverse pasture looks like once we get it nice and seeded. A lot of some meadow fescues. There's clovers in there. Uh, really a, a nice good sward of grass, nice and thick and dense uh, for cows to eat, and provides pretty good uh, nutrition for those. When we uh, kind of turn them out to pasture, there they're all quite happy in the spring uh, when they first go out to graze. This was early this year. Um, 
in I think early uh, early May, May 18th is when we grazed the first time this year. So uh, we we did that quite well. And you can see uh, when you get into June, the grass start growing uh, quite a bit, and you get lots of grass, and grass grows quite quickly. Uh, so some people have have decided to, to hay that. Um, we 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 don't do that. We let our cows uh, pretty much graze everything, and if it gets a little bit higher, uh, maybe that's okay because we we might not need let those cows need all that high protein uh, in in the grass. Uh, here's another picture of some of our species. You can see the the chicory uh, growing there, and some of these and and the cows do like that chicory. They tend to go for the the clovers and the chicory first in the pasture, and then they maybe go for some of the orchard grass uh, right behind it. But really, a a nice, good, diverse pasture mixture. And this is really what I wanted to see when we when we go out in the pastures, and you know, it um, it's it looks quite well and and provides lots of good nutrition out there. So here's our what I did for our oats and turnips. Uh, we seeded those at 96 pounds an acre. Uh, and we we put in some turnips about five pounds an acre uh, into our pastures. Uh, obviously, we you know we we are out uh, renovating pastures. We're we're plowing pastures, and um, I know there's some people that might not like uh, renovation of pastures and having to go out and plow it, and um, and uh, those such. We are looking at the nutrient cycling and the nutrients uh, uh, from a soil fertility perspective on what happens when when we do all of that plowing to the nitrogen balance in the soil and I'm not going to present that today but it does provide some pretty interesting results uh, in an organic situation uh, when we do that. So this is uh, when we seeded uh, this uh, middle of August this is September 7th of this year what it sort of looks like uh, when it when it comes up uh, 10 days later you can see um, you know the the turnips are starting to come up. Uh, you get the oats uh, uh, growing well. Everything's starting to fill in um, across the pasture. And seven days later, you get a nice pasture sward of oats and and turnips, and provides a lot of great forage uh, as well. And and it does grow quite quickly. At, between those two pictures, about three days, you can see a lot of the, the turnips are quite um, leafy, and there's a lot of forage out there. And you know, we're standing here, you know, September 28th this year. I'm looking out there, and going, man, there's a lot of grass uh, for our cows. And um, you can look at some of these turnips if you pull them up. They don't get very big on the bulb. Most of the most of it's very leafy, but they do. Uh, the cows might eat some of the bulbs if they do. Um, but typically, they're pretty much eating the eating the grass and here we are, a nice, still a nice sunny day in October, and they're still um, still grazing that oats and turnips mixture. So if I can, you know, in the upper Midwest here, we can graze in, into October. We're doing quite well. One thing about this slide I'd like to show uh, as we sort of kind of move into the last few slides that I have here, one is feed, at, feed analysis report. Um, I think one of the big things is uh, we need to know what the mineral quality is, what the forage quality is of our pasture. That's probably number one. If, if I could uh, have the main takeaway message from today is you should sample your pastures, send it in for an analysis to see what's there. You want to be able to look at the, uh, the protein. This pasture uh, was from September 4th. You can see that it's over 30% protein uh, here even in September on a perennial pasture that's really quite high uh, so we're we we're, we're still at very high protein levels on on that pasture and um, you know there's all these minerals the same pasture uh, on the right three weeks later protein down to 24 so there's even within a few weeks time period there's some pretty big differences in forage quality as the grazing season type sort of ends. But really, we, we want to know what, what's in our pastures. We want to know the digestibility, the protein levels, um, and what's happening. So these are 
some of the we'll talk about some of the results that we've shown by looking at these warm season grasses. These were some sort of some grazing plots that we established uh, here in, in Morris, looking at some different alternative warm season grasses. We looked at TEF, just a sorghum sedan, a BMR sorghum sedan, some pearl millet, uh, some rocks cane, which is a sweet sorghum, and then some grazing corn. And you know, the, the rocks cane, the sweet sorghum, obviously that produced uh, quite well. It produced the most tonnage per acre, uh, but the sorghum sedans did quite well uh, as far as production as well. Crude protein was uh, kind of all over the board. The TEF grass uh, in this experiment had the highest crude protein, uh, but maybe those protein levels are just fine around 15 for some of the sorghum sedans and the millets, uh, but they're very high digestibility, all over uh, 50 except for the grazing corn, and they provide a pretty good nutrient profile when we look at total digestible nutrients. Those warm season grasses do quite well. The grazing corn, uh, probably not so much, and I might not include that in a mix uh, if I was going to do some pastures, uh, but the sorghum sedans and the millets do quite well. So here's uh, some results from our our study that we, we looked at, we took three years of pasture samples. I had a lot of undergraduate students and graduate students out taking pasture samples every time the cows moved into an, a new paddock. So we, we took a lot of pasture samples. I'm very thankful for a lot of the people that worked uh, on this project to try and just get a handle on what the forage quality is of all these grasses across the grazing season. But you can look at the cool season grasses. These are our perennial pastures uh, versus our, our warm season grasses uh, together. And then we have, I've split out the, the BMR sorghum sedan grass, the teff grass, and then the oats and turnips just to see what they look like. We look at protein levels. Obviously, uh, you know, across the grazing season, uh, the perennial pastures are going to be higher in protein, and we know that. Uh, the BMR uh, sorghum sedan and the teff grass right around 18% protein. However, surprisingly, the oats and turnips are really quite high in, in protein, so really a good, a good supply of protein there. Digestibilities run in the 50s, uh, NDF uh, for, for these cool season and warm season grass, maybe not so much for the oats and turnips, uh, not quite as high uh, for those. If we remember uh, go back to some of the earlier graphs where I talked about net energy of lactation on recommended levels being about 0.7 um, for for cows. So, you know, these are obviously a little bit below what we want, but they do provide some pretty good nutrition for um, net energy of lactation, and, and the oats and turnips are, are really high, uh, the highest of all of them. And probably the big thing is we can, we can get milk off these uh, different grasses. Like I said, these cows were not supplemented very much that we grazed. Got about six pounds of organic corn and minerals, and that, that was it uh, for the last three grazing seasons. So we can get pretty good uh, milk levels, and you know the oats and turnips do provide some pretty good uh, production as well. We took, looked at the, some of the major minerals uh, in these grasses. Uh, calcium about the same for for uh, the warm season versus the cool season. Uh, the TEF may be a little bit lower. Oats and turnips are really quite high uh, for calcium. Phosphorus um, all about the same and uh, potassium was about the same for the cool season and the warm season uh, grasses. However, the oats and turnips were, are, were much higher. Um, for those, so really, you know, they um, the, these warm season grasses do provide uh, pretty good nutrition, uh, very comparable to to uh, uh, the cool perennial pastures. So this is sort of what it looks like uh, across the grazing season uh, for dry matter. And the, in the blue are our perennial pastures. The red is the warm season grasses. Green is the BMR sorghum sedan, and the yellow is the TEF. So really, if you you know, obviously in June we don't have the warm season grasses. In July, uh, dry matter is around 15%, but then it it goes up uh, as we go throughout the grazing season. And October we tend to see the highest probably dry matter percentages of any of the grasses. Crude protein does change uh, quite a bit 
across, you can see here that our crude protein in our cool season pastures actually goes up as the grazing season goes on right around 21 in June and we're close to 25 in October in our perennial pastures. Our warm season grasses tend to go down. That first grazing in July, uh, you get about 20 percent protein and, and then you drop to 15 and 16 uh, throughout the rest. And we find that in the, the TEF uh, as well and the sorghum sedan maybe uh, it's a little more consistent across the grazing season for, for crude protein. Digestibility, uh, NDF digestibility, um, pretty consistent across the grazing season for these different species. July, obviously, the when the cool season pastures start to slow down, the digestibility is much higher. When we go to a warm season grazing mix, uh, August about the same, and then digestibility is kind of tick up a little bit as we go into September and in October when cows tend to like grazing a little bit more August. You can see why maybe they don't like to graze as much in August. The digestibilities on the grasses maybe aren't quite as good as what we see in other parts of the, the grazing season. So what about production? Everybody asks, well, can, can these cows, can cows milk off of these grasses? And, and uh, so we had lots of different cow groups uh, uh, on production. You can see most of this is sort of our production averages across the, the grazing season for our different, uh, different groups. They obviously do quite well in June and drop off. This is you know, more, more of a seasonal type production you see where they we get like maximum pr milk production in May and June. However, 2015 was a little bit different than what we saw in 2014. You know, cows are not the same year to year. Some groups do quite well, some cows maybe not so well, uh, depending on the weather. Um, weather is a, a big factor in all of this, and breed, like I said, and size and milk production, there's many things that go, go into this. However, if you look at kind of the daily milk production of these cows uh, here across the 2014, the blue line is our perennial pastures, what the milk production is. And the red line is our warm season grasses. Uh, in 2014, most of the cows, they were milking about the same, uh, whether they were on a cool season pasture or a warm season pasture. Maybe the production ticked up a little bit higher here in, in October with those cows, uh, when some of the cows went to that oats and turnips. Uh, the, this is the group that went to that oats turnips mix uh, versus the cows that were on perennial pasture. So maybe we get some increased in milk production there. Some of you might ask, well, what happened in early September 2014? Well, here in the Midwest, we had a nice 80 degree day with a, a dew point that was in the 70s. So it was really hot and sticky. Uh, and it basically took its toll on the cows. And when it our cows are outside. Uh, we don't have any freestyle barns or anything for our cows to retreat into during the day. So production is affected when, when the weather spikes up and we have uh, some unusual weather type events. So that that's what that dip is there. And it affected both groups the same. So really whether they were on one or not, uh, uh, weather plays a big factor. Uh, in 2015, well, you'll notice that dip again end of June, same thing happened. We had a nice, hot, humid day, and it affected the cows quite significantly, kind of an unusual uh, weather event. Uh, but you can look uh, here, if we go along the production levels, um, do quite well. The cows are, are milking about the same in the early part, but when we get to about mid-July, you'll notice the production goes up. Well, in the cows, that's the first grazing of sorghum sedan grass that these cows went on. So when they are, this group here is averaging about 32, and they go up to maybe 36. So they increase about four pounds of milk when they've gone on to that sorghum sedan grass. But then when they, you know, they're grazing on the sorghum sedan grass, and then they have to go back to a perennial pasture system that we grazed in June. So maybe production doesn't do well. Ticks up again here in mid-August when they grazed the sorghum sedan grass a second time, um, and then it kind of 
comes back together again and maybe we see another uptick here in early September maybe not so much as what we saw in the early part when they grace that sorghum sedan grass again so really I think you know we can maintain pretty good production by by moving to these warm season grass species and um, there are some differences in production maybe it would be nice if these warm season grasses grew the whole year and provided good forage quality like we did here in early July and we might be able to increase production and keep that production load uh, quite a bit. So to kind of conclude uh, today's webinar, I presented a lot of information on pasture quality and forage quality and you know some of the big take-homes are you know pasture management within a farm can really influence forage quality. Uh, it depends on how you manage your pastures. Do you need to reseed them? Do you provide soil fertility, soil amendments to them? Uh, all of that has influence in forage quality. Irrigation can affect forage quality. So within a farm, pasture management has a greater influence than maybe season or year. Uh, depends on how we graze them when with, we get into those types of situations. And there's many factors, like I said, that certainly affect um, pasture quality. But I think based on you know our research, uh, some of that BMR sorghum sedan grass and teff grass can be used to complement our forage production system. Uh, the BMR does quite well. The teff, um, it I like the teff, but um, when the weather is uh, not very cooperative, uh, it didn't grow very well. Especially here in 2015, we saw maybe not so good a grass growth on the teff grass because of the weather. But during the dry season, uh, they can provide great emergency forages. Uh, they grow fast, and they provide really good tonnage of feed. And then we're we're basically we're going to continue exploring these. I think there's a, a real need to look at some of these, and I think we're going to start seeing a lot of those issues, uh, um, especially as feed becomes higher. People don't like supplementing cows in the middle of the summertime, and I think if we went to some of these warm season grasses, we might be able to help complement our system and, and reduce some of our feed costs. So with that, I thank you for uh, attending today and uh, hopefully you, you learned something you may be able to take back with your, uh, your farm or some of the people that you work with and uh, be able to look at some of these. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Brad. I appreciate it. I will be reading questions out loud to Brad and he will answer um, as many as we have time for. But if um, after the webinar you have additional questions, uh, feel free to use the um, online Ask an Expert system um, at the link that you may see there. Yep, right there. Use a extension Ask an Expert service. Okay, we have some questions in the queue, so I'm just going to launch right in. Okay, Brad? Sure. <laughs> um, so do you maintain a permanent annual fields? is part A of a question, and then what do you plant or do after those annual grazings? A good question. So yes, some of our pastures we've maintained as permanent annual ones, and we might rotate those between a sorghum sedan or a teff grass. Uh, like I said, we're, we're, we're wanting to explore some more of these to, to do that. However, some of these I, I think um, we're going to move back into a, a perennial system and sort of maybe renovate some of the other pastures. So we'll, after a, a couple years of warm season grasses, we're going to move back in, move them back into a, a permanent pasture and of a lot of different species mixes. You know, alfalfa, meadow fescue, orchard grass. Um, I think these summer annuals can be used as a sort of a pasture renovation too, or if you've got some permanent pastures that's not growing very well, you can rip them up, grow some summer annuals for a couple years, and then move them back into a, a permanent pasture. Great. Can you speak briefly about relative costs of using summer annuals? How economical would it be for organic dairy to use some of these summer annuals? Uh, good question. <laughs> so we, we, we do have some uh, Economics, we've got some a graduate student in economics It's going to be looking at the economics of these. Um, obviously, um, you have some costs. You have seed costs every year where you might not have in a, in a permanent pasture. You know, a, um, a, a bag of organic BMR sorghum sedan is about $100. 
Uh, Teff grass is, you know, can range between two fifty and five dollars a pound, uh, depending on the year, to seed these. And you might have some, you know, you've you've got some costs in tractor uh, fuel uh, and time uh, to do that. We we here have about twenty five acres of um, summer annuals and about a hundred acres of permanent pasture. So, you know, we. I think it's a small portion of it. Uh, you don't have the the full thing, but there is going to be some costs. But really, I think you know the the costs are probably not as big as if you have to go out and buy hay or go into stored feed over the summertime if there's a drought or a weather event. Obviously, we can't predict those when we're coming into June. We we might. We might not be able to predict those. Like I wasn't able to predict that the Teff wouldn't grow very well this year, so that was, you know, that was kind of a loss. But you know, farming can be some that way sometimes. Um, but really, I, um, so I, I probably didn't answer your question uh, as well. There's there's going to be some cost to it, but they produce a lot of forage. Like I said, you get some increased production maybe when you when you go into those uh, grass species, and I think the those will outweigh the the costs uh, that it takes to sort of plant these species, which isn't much if you if you don't have a lot of acres. You know, 25 acres for us is not it's not much. Maybe a thousand dollars a year. Great. Um, did you provide any kind of transition or adaptation time for the cows that were changed from cool uh, season to warm season pastures? Uh, no, there was uh, no adaptation whatsoever. These cows, when they were done grazing the cool season grasses and we needed to give them a rest, we went right into the, the BMR sorghum sedan grass pasture. So there was no rest. And actually, I, we, I, I went out there when we first let the cows out and watched them. They, uh, they might not know what that is because it's uh, pretty leafy. It stands taller. Uh, so they they kind of go into it. Some of them are a little scared right away, eating it right away, and then they run all the way to the other end of the paddock. So they kind of got to figure out what it is first before they start grazing it. But yeah, we 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 do quite well without the transition. Okay, um, how much decreased uh, dry matter intake does a pasture-based herd have compared to a winter program? Well, you probably are going to uh, consume. A little bit less. It just depends on the the forage quality of of the pasture. Um, actually, we we probably have about the same dry matter intake on a dry matter basis uh, when we're out on pasture versus when we're feeding a full TMR um, on our cows because we 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 size our our pastures so we were able to have the right amount of cows on it to provide for sort of a maximum dry matter intake, similar to what we do in a winter feeding program and. Um, Obviously, and we have different breeds, so some breeds are going to eat more than others, um, but we really don't see much of a, a decrease at all. Um, were you surprised that milk production didn't increase incorporating summer annuals into your system? I was a little uh, a, a little surprised. I think you know if you remember my graphs, I, we did get a little bit of an uptick in in uh, some of the sorghum sedans uh, when we first went on them. Um, I think, and then you maybe saw them drop off a little bit and go back towards some more of the perennial pasture. I think because, well, frankly, we 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 don't have an, as much some of that warm season grass as what I'd like, and maybe we if we could. You know, extend the amount of summer annuals that we had, so I can provide almost a full month or six weeks of grazing off of summer annuals, and really give the perennial pastures a mix. We might see even, I think we'll see a, a even better production response. Yeah, I was, I didn't expect to to, to see them come back. I, I expected to see a little bit of increased production when they first went on to them, but I was hoping they would be able to maintain that throughout. Okay, I'm just going right down the line here, so some of these might not um, be related to the last. Um, so, do you uh, always have to till, or can you no-till seed into an existing pasture? A good question. Um, well, I think 
you want to get good seed to soil contact is probably the foremost. Um, I think it's probably recommended and I'd recommend to going into a sort of a lightly dissed field like like we did or or a plowed pasture and seed it. I did experiment with it once to try and seed sorghum sedan grass into a existing sod and it, it grew. Uh, it didn't grow as well as what it did on the the plowed field so you do have some yield reduction in, in grass uh, when I planted sorghum sedan into a existing sod. Um, the teff grass when I did that it didn't work at all. Uh, the other perennial grasses just choked out the teff. Um, but the sorghum sedan grass did grow but it just it didn't do quite as well as what, what I saw with it being plowed so I'd really recommend going into a, a, a worked up field. Okay and why not use perennial warm season grasses? Um, yeah, I think you certainly could. I, that, that's a great question. I think you could use some of those perennial uh, warm season grasses. And um, I think the reason we went to some of these sorghum sedans and uh, teff grasses because some of the, the farms were up here in, in Minnesota were, were actually exploring with some of those. We had some grazing producers that were using teff and uh, some were using sorghum sedan. So those were... Those were we went to those grasses because that's what some of the organic farmers were doing here and and were interested in seeing what what would happen if we did it in a research setting and um, so that's that's why we went that way but yeah I think there's a lot of annual warm season uh, sort of grasses that we could use uh, for the, for that. Um, did you try straight up Sudan grass? Uh, we, we we did not we did not try straight up Sudan grass. Okay. Nope. Um, in your early slides on pasture forage quality, you showed that net energy levels were almost at the goal, but carb availability was low. Why does that matter if NEL is okay? Uh, good question. Uh, I think the you know the 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 NEL is is very close depending on the grass uh, species mixture. If if you can. Uh, maintain that NEL level, then maybe the carb level doesn't matter. I think uh, probably going back to my big thing is we need to sample the pastures to see what they are. And if you do sample your pastures and you ha have high NEL, then maybe you don't need to supplement um, with with carbohydrates or corn or oats or whatever else. But um, a lot of people tend not to do that, so it, it, it's hard to, to make recommendations if, if they haven't sampled their pastures. Mm -hmm. Have you considered doing a soil analysis um, previous to seeding so that you might base your decision on what type of pasture to seed? Uh, yes, I, I definitely would recommend doing a, a soil analysis to see um, what, what the soil uh, profile is, the nutrient profile, and yeah, we you certainly can make recommendations depending on grass species. You know, maybe if you do... Um, see that you you might pick some species uh, over over the next we we have extensive soil tests on these I, I I you know for lack of time I don't have any of that data uh, but every time the cows went in to these pastures and when they left we have a soil sample of the pasture so we have hundreds and thousands of soil samples uh, every time these cows went into pasture so we'll be able to give some pretty good information uh, here uh, after the next year. But yeah, I think you can, you know, sampling your soils is probably the, the good thing and yeah, you can certainly make recommendations based on that. Okay, and you might have just answered this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. How does good forage quality provide for good soil health and sustainability? <laughs> yeah, well, if you have, you know, good soil health, you obviously are going to produce much better forage uh, in for your cows to graze. So I think, you know, making sure that the soil fertility is good and, you know, if you plant, the, your, if your soils are not very good and you go in and seed some of these warm season annuals, they're obviously not going to grow very well. The proteins might be lower. The digestibility might be lower. So, you know, soil fertility is, is a plus as well. Like I said, we've we put some manure on, on these to sort of maintain the nitrogen and fertility levels uh, that we, we might see uh, when when we plow the field up, so we've tried to help help these grasses by doing that as well. 
Great. Um, let me just see. I think we have responded to all the questions in the queue here. Um, maybe we should just give one more second or two to uh, let any last minute questions come in. And while I'm doing that, I'm just going to type into the little question box here um, the link to our eOrganic webinars, the past webinars as well. Um, we have um, had other um, webinars on summer annuals as well as uh, uh, pasture quality. So I just wanted to make sure that some the folks know about some of those. Okay, here's um, a question. Um, don't NEL and N SC actually measure energy differently, so is it important to look at both? Uh, yeah, I would definitely look at both. Um, really, when you think about non-fiber carbohydrates uh, in those measures, that's where you start thinking about supplementation with corn. When when people look at the NFC level, you're thinking about what what do we need to do to increase the carb load, and do we need to supplement with corn or oats or something like that. Um, but yeah, you should look at NEL and NFC. Now we've we've sort of gone away from the supplementing grain levels here at, at Morris, so I don't really look at much of the NFC anymore uh, because we um, I'm, we're not really into supplementing cows uh, during the summertime. We want to be able to that cow produce what from what the grass that we have. Um, so we we tend to not to look at that uh, as much anymore. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. Were the production of all these herds pasture only and no concentrates? You just gonna ask that? Yeah. Yeah. We feed. We we fed about six pounds of grain. Uh, so very minimal. Very minimal amount of grain. And that. And then that was it. To the whole from, you know, May 18th until uh, October 16th, all they got was six pounds of grain uh, per day. So not not much at all. Most of it was grass. Okay. All right, it looks like that's going to be all of our questions. I'd like to thank you all for, for typing in those questions. Um, and as I mentioned before, this uh, webinar is part of an ongoing series at eOrganic. We'll be joined next month by um, Brad again, who will be um, also joined by Roger Moon um, from the University of Minnesota, and they'll be talking about some unique fly control strategies. So I'm excited about that. Brad. Thank you so much for joining us today and thank everyone for coming.